Now, welcome to a short tutorial on Microsoft Access, uh, particularly how to formulate uh, queries in Microsoft Access. I am Martin Schettelbauer, and this is a tutorial for CS 1100 at Northeastern University. Uh, this uh, tutorial is um, about how to store, access, search, and view information uh, from a database, uh, an activity that is very important in any business. Uh, while spreadsheets like Microsoft Excel are also often used for data storage, uh, they really only work well for small amounts of data. When the data gets larger, then you have to use a database. Learning how to access data is a very important skill when working with databases. And what we're going to do in this tutorial is learn how to formulate queries in the Microsoft Access uh, database system. Now what we learn here is applicable to many other databases uh, that are used by businesses, uh, including Oracle, Sybase, Microsoft SQL Server, uh, Java DB. Um, beyond learning how to work with databases, we'll also learn how to decompose problems and think a lot more logically and methodically. A skill that is transferable and is also very valuable for other uh, types of um, uh, areas. Now we're going to be using a database um, that contains data for orders that are placed by customers in uh, some fictitious uh, computer store. And uh, this database is going to be used for a lot of the examples in this tutorial and also for the lab exercises in the CS 1100 course. So it's uh, very important that you become intimately familiar with this database. Uh, this database stores uh, bunch of information including the following. It um, stores uh, orders that customers have placed. It tracks how much uh, was ordered in each order, at what price uh, the item in the order was sold, how many items are in that order, who placed that order, where that person called a contact or a customer uh, lives, you know, including their address, and other pertinent demographic information. And then for each product that we sell, it contains pertinent product information, the price of the product, the weight, height, um, and so on. So the database contains a lot of information about the various aspects of our store. And what we're going to do is we're going to learn how to query that database and extract information from the database for uh, various purposes. Now here's an example of what such um, a query or a set of queries might eventually do. Eventually we're going to take the queries we're going to formulate and integrate them into reports. Uh, so here's an example of what uh, an order might look like in this store. So here we have an order. Each order has an order number. Uh, it applies to a particular customer contact. Uh, each customer contact, again, has an ID. So in this particular case, we're talking about order 0001. Uh, placed by contact C004, um, name of that person is Nicholas Colon, um, living in Coral Springs, Florida. He placed that order on 4-15-1999, and um, he placed an order for three different products that we carry, product uh, P13, P14, and P27. And uh, for example, P13 is a set of DVD discs. And uh, he ordered one set of DVD discs at the unit price of $23. Uh, he also placed an order for high-density floppy disks. He ordered four of them. Each one of them cost $9.99. So the total uh, floppy disk um, cost was four times $9.99 for a total of $39.96, uh, which is what we call the extended price. And then he also ordered a software program called Norton Antivirus, and that makes this entire total for the order, uh, the sum of those extended prices, and the total order was for $178.91. Now Microsoft Access is a very particular type of database. It's called a relational database, uh, which means that it stores information in tables that themselves are related. Each table is a chunk of information about a particular entity in our business. And each row in that table is a record. So for example, we have a, a table that stores all the contacts. We have a table that stores all the orders. Think of each table as like a mini spreadsheet. And each row in that table contains 
um, a record, uh, for example, a particular customer, a particular order, a particular product, and each one of us identified through some unique identifier. Uh, let's, in fact, go take a minute and look at the database um, in a little bit more detail. The database overall has five tables, a table that stores products, one that stores orders, contacts, and then two more that are not immediately apparent what they mean, line items and zip codes. Now, one thing you may notice when you work with relational databases is that the information is often split into lots of different tables rather than having one big, gigantic table like we would have in Excel. The reason for that is that we go through a process called normalization uh, to uh, make sure that data is stored without duplicates and in a very efficient manner. And that form of database is called a relational database. So what I would like you to do is I would like to invite you to download um, Lab A1 or one of the other lab databases that deals with the order database and follow along as we go through the rest of the tutorial. In fact, I'm also going to switch over to my Microsoft Access uh, database and show you what that looks like. So I've actually um, loaded Lab A1, which you can get from Blackboard. And uh, once I open it, you may notice that there are five tables in the database. Uh, by the way, when you download uh, the file from um, Blackboard, make sure that you, um, when you get the choice, you do not click Open, but rather you click Save. You save the database file to a local file, and then you open that local file. Open it directly from Blackboard uh, causes problems, so I would uh, not recommend that at all. You will lose your work. So let's go ahead and look at what the tables contain. What I'm going to do is I'm going to double click on the contact table to get the rows in that table. So as you can see, we have a whole bunch of contacts in here. We have uh, Ronald McWilliams. We have Scott uh, Heiler. We have uh, Jake Smith, uh, Paul Greenson, and so on. Uh, Paul Greenson, for example, is customer uh, well, his contact ID 20. He lives at 133 Beach Tree Road at uh, zip code 33139. Now, what you may notice is that we don't actually see anything about what that is. To find out what uh, city and state um, 33139 is, we would actually have to go to another table called the zip codes table. And to do that, we can go to that and move down. And uh, I think it was, uh, let's go back to this, it was uh, 33139. So 33139 turns out to be Miami Beach, Florida. And same thing with the uh, products table. It contains information about the different products we're selling, um, product ID, product name, what the unit costs, how many we have in stock, width and height for shipping, the uh, depth for shipping, and, of course, the weight, also very important for shipping. Then we have two more tables, an orders table which is actually fairly small. It only includes three what we call columns. Each one of these is called a column. So we have an order ID column, contact ID column, and order date column. The order ID, of course, is the ID of the order, but notice it does not contain anything about who ordered this. Instead, order number five, in this particular case, O0005, was ordered by contact C001. So to find out exactly who placed that order, we would have to go to the context table and look up contact 0001. So if you go over here to the context table and we look for contact 1, there you go. We find out that it's um, an order that was placed by Benjamin Lee. Now, what did Benjamin Lee order? Well, the orders table does not contain that information. There is another table called line items that contains that information. Line items contains a line item ID and an order ID. So this means that this particular line item right here applies to order one, this applies to order one, and this applies to order one. Now, what was ordered as part of order one? Well, there are three items that were ordered as part of order one, product 13, product 14, and product 27. Now, to find out what those products are, again, we would have to go to the products table and look up product 13, 14, and 27. And then finally, we find out in the line items table how much of that product the person ordered and 
what they paid for it. So as you can see, the information is actually located in a number of different tables, and the tables themselves are linked. The linkage goes through these IDs. So product ID is the primary key, as we call it, for products, the unique identifier for products, and that links it to the line items where each line item contains a product ID. So it's kind of like a, a point or a reference, uh, an address, if you will, to a record in another table. So it's kind of a distributed way of storing information. So when we look back at the original order that we looked at, order number one, where does the different information come from? So the order number comes from orders.orderID. If you look back at this, we can go take a peek. So orders for order number one, where's order number one? Right here, is for customer C004. So looking back at the order, that's indeed C004. Who is that? Well, I don't find that out from... The orders table, I've got to go to the context table. C004 is Nicholas Cologne. Now, where does Nick live? He lives at 9020 uh, Northwest 75th Street. Yep, right here. And that belongs to 33065, which is in the zip codes table. 33065 is Coral Springs, Florida. Now, what did he order? Well, he, first of all, he ordered, if you look back to the orders table, he ordered the, uh, the uh, stuff on 4-15-1999. And what did he order? Well, that information we get from the line items. So we go to the line items table, and we look for order number 1, and we find the order product 13, 14, and 27, which we get from the products table. So different parts of this particular report actually come from different tables. And so what we have to do is we have to learn how to retrieve that data by building queries. Now, queries in Microsoft Excel, uh, sorry, Microsoft Access, are formulated in a very specialized language called SQL. Well, it's actually um, written SQL, and a lot of people actually call it SQL, but a lot of people also pronounce it SQL. Now, we actually don't have to learn that particular programming language. Uh, instead, we can use a very simple drag and drop interface called the Query Builder or Query Designer. And it makes uh, the construction of queries in Microsoft Access very simple. Now, eventually, we're going to take those queries and we're going to in integrate those queries into reports, like uh, uh, this, this one here. Later on, we're also going to learn how to add it to more complex reports. And programmers also often take the queries and put them into programs, uh, dynamic web pages, uh, website designs. Or if you're doing ad hoc, sort of on-the-fly type of querying, you just you know, want to kind of find out a few things about uh, the data that you have in your store, you can simply run the queries by themselves. So let me take you through the different steps that uh, you need to go through to construct queries. Now, queries fundamentally retrieve data from tables, one table or multiple tables. When you formulate the query, you can specify from which tables you want the data, which rows you want to include in the result, and which columns, which fields you want to include in the result. Now, the result that comes out of this query is actually a table as well. And later on, we're going to study how to use that query um, or that, that, that virtual table that comes back as a table in another query, basically using that query as a sub-query. That's going to be very powerful when we use it to decompose problems. Now, to create a query, you need to click uh, Create on the Create tab and then pick Query Designer. That's part of the Query Builder. Let me go ahead and show you how to do this. So to create a query, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to close all of these tables that we have opened. I click on the Create tab, and I go to Query Designer. And you might want to follow along with us and you know, pause the video every once in a while to go ahead and catch up and kind of do this thing on your own. And then this um, dialog pops up. I tend to close it out, although you can also use it to you know, immediately select which um, tables are going to be part of your query. So now once you have that, you're ready to perform a query. So let's go ahead and create a query that lists all the people in our database, all our contacts. 
So the information about the context is in the context table. We'll drag that in. Just click and drag and drop. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. And then to specify which fields or which columns you want as part of the results, again, if you look at the context table quickly, I'm going to double click on it, you'll see that it contains one, two, three, four, five, six fields or columns. And let's say I'm going to select the last name and the phone number. Uh, so let's do first name, last name, and phone number for every uh, contact to maybe create a phone list so we can do some sales calling. So we'll drag and then drop the first name, the last name, and the phone number. Now, once you're done with this, you need to execute the query. To do that, you click on Query Tools. If it's not already open, if that um, ribbon is not open, you click on Query Tools up here. And then once you've done that, you simply click on Run. And that runs the query. So now that selects the data that you have specified from the table that you have selected. So it gives me first name, last name, and phone number. I can switch back to my query design by clicking back on this View button, and this will take me back to my design. So I can kind of switch back and forth between running it and viewing it. And that gives you a way of sort of incrementally refining my query. Uh, you don't have to get the queries often uh, right the first time. You kind of can often play with it and try a few things out until you get the right result. So let's go back to a uh, bit more stuff and show you how to create a few more complex queries. So the simple query that we've already seen is one that simply extracts information from a single table. Now when you create more complex queries, you will find that often uh, multiple rows are included. Or the same row is included multiple times in the result. And there is a particular way of dealing with this in Access by grouping rows, which kind of takes multiple like rows and bunches them together into a single bucket, and then only displays one of the rows in that bucket. And there's a particular way of doing this by selecting the, uh, the total button in the ribbon and then selecting group by. In fact, let me give you an example of how this group by works. So let's say we want to find the dates on which orders were placed. We want to kind of know when we do sales and if we have maybe some days where we don't do sales. So let me go ahead and switch back to my access and show you how to do this. So I'm going to start a new query. Create, query design. I'm going to close this. So I've got to do a query uh, where we find the dates on which the orders were placed. Now, order dates are in the orders table. If you don't remember where they are, you kind of just open up the table, double-click on it, and kind of look. And eventually, you kind of know what is where in the database. I don't need that anymore, so I'm going to close it. I also don't need the contacts. I'm going to close that as well. And in fact, uh, let's go ahead and drag the orders table in here. I want to know the order date, so I'm going to select the order date. And then I'm going to run it. Click on Query Tools and run it. And what you will notice is that some dates, like 418, 421, 422, and so on, occur multiple times. Well, that's because you actually had three orders on 418, only one order on 415, one order on 420, two orders on 421, three orders on 422, and so on. But I don't want to know every day on which, uh, I don't want to know uh, all the orders and the dates on which they were placed. I want to just know the dates. I don't care how many orders were placed on 418. I just want to know that an order was placed on 418. So how do we remove duplicates? Well, let's go back to our query design. The, uh, the trick is to have access recognize that rows are alike, and it should bunch them or group them together. So to do that, you click on the Totals button up here in the ribbon. And then in the total row that now appears in your query designer, you select out of the drop-down Group By, which happens, of course, also to be the default. 
Now when you run it, you get just the dates without duplicates. And in fact, if you look down here, you have 26 different dates on which orders were placed. Now when you want to perform more complex queries, you're going to find that the information that you're seeking is not in a single table. So we need to learn how to formulate queries that uh, extract data from multiple tables. That is done by conducting what we call a join, where you select data from multiple tables. For example, suppose you want to find the contacts that placed an order and um, display those. Let me go back to my access. So let me go back to the first query that we've done, where it just had the contacts, first name, last name, and phone number. So if I run this, and you look down here, you will find that there were 25, oops, there were 25 um, contacts in my contacts table. Now, the question is this. Did every contact that's in the contacts table actually place an order? Probably not. There might be some people that we track that we may want to send mailings to, but that don't necessarily have uh, ever place an order. So how do we know which of these customers, which of these contacts actually placed an order? Well, the trick is to realize that the orders table contains the order ID and the contact who placed the order. So all we really have to do is kind of match up. If we match up all these contact IDs that are in here, contact one, two for this one, uh, three for this one, four, six, seven. If we match these up against the contacts in the contacts table, well, if they don't appear in orders, we don't really care because it basically means that they never placed an order. So how can we do this in Access? Well, it's actually not that hard. Let's create another query. Create. Query design. And let's drag in contacts. Now, how do I get access to recognize that I only want those contacts that also are in the orders table? Well, it's actually very simple. If I drag in both contacts and orders, Microsoft Access knows that these two are linked. That contact ID in the orders uh, table refers to a contact ID in the context table. So well, for every order, the contact ID kind of points to a row in here. And so when you have two tables that are joined, when you run this query, and I'm going to put down first name, last name, and phone number, I actually only get those contacts, first name, last name, and phone number that appear in both this table and that table. So by doing a join, I get all the customers who placed at least one order. And let's go run that and see what happens. Notice now if I run this, I get 21 as, oh, sorry, actually um, 39. Well, because I have duplicates, so I've got to remove the duplicates. So the removing the duplicates, go back to the design view, is done by clicking on totals and doing a group by across all of them. And that takes all the rows that are the same, and collapses them into one. So run that, and we get 21 distinct customers who placed an order, which is different than what we had before. Before, recall, oops, go back to query one. Before, if you recall this, if I took the first name, last name, and phone number just of contacts without linking it to the orders table, I get 25. So that means there are four customers in this list who never placed any order. Now, there are more advanced SQL commands. We could actually find out which customers never placed an order, but it's a little bit beyond uh, the scope of our tutorial right now. So let's go and study this notion of grouping a little bit more. It turns out that whenever you group, Microsoft Access actually does not lose what's in the group. It kind of remembers what's in the group. So let's go back to our Microsoft Access 
example. So let's look at this query right here. This one we just did. So again, let's suppose it didn't do a group by. Let's get rid of the group by and run it again. You notice that a lot of customers appear multiple times. So when you do a group by, what you're actually doing is you're taking rows that are identical. So for example, this row right here for Ben Lee, and you collapse it into a single row. So these four rows are kind of bunched into a single row. And for Eleanor Milgram, these uh, four rows are bunched into one. Nicholas Colon, these two rows are bunched into one. For Jeffrey uh, Modell, one, two, three, four, five are bunched into one. So when we run it with a group by, what's really happening is for Ben Lee, there's really behind this one row, four rows in that group. We don't see what's behind it in the output, but it's there. Can we take advantage of this? Well, yes, we can. Think about it. Again, let me get rid of the group by and run this. What does this really mean that Ben Lee appears four times? Well, it means that there are four orders in the order table that reference Ben Lee. That means Ben Lee has placed four orders. So we can use that to do queries like, how many orders did Benjamin Lee place? So how many orders did each customer place? And we can do that by using aggregate functions. So again, let's introduce the group by and run it. We get the bunching. Now can we do something with the bunched records? And indeed we can. What we can do is we can add a count field. And we're going to call it num orders colon. Let me just make this a little bit bigger so you can see all of this. And we use a function called count star. And we select from the drop-down, not group by, but instead expression. And what this will do, count star is one of the built-in aggregate functions of access. It counts how many rows are in each group. So when we run this, we will get a fourth column called num orders. And the value of that will be the number of rows in each subgroup. So run it, and you get... Alan Turing, num orders two, Benjamin Lee, as we said, four, Jeff Modell, five. That means that Jeff Modell placed five orders. There are five rows in his group. And so that's a, qu a great quick way of finding out and counting, uh, in this particular case, how many orders each customer has placed. Now we can also do some filtering on this. For example, Let's go ahead and find only the customers who placed at least two orders. So what we can do is we can add to the criteria a greater than two. And now if we run it, we get only those customers where the num orders column is greater than two, meaning customers who placed more than two orders. So that's what we call a filter. Now let's work a little bit with those line items. Let's do another query. Create design. And this time what I want to do is I want you to bring in the orders table and the line items table. And we're going to select the order ID. And I want you to bring in the line item ID, the quantity, and the unit price. And let's go run it. So this means that order one has line item one a quantity of one of that product at $23. Order one also has line item two and line item three. A quantity of four at 99 each, a quantity of one at 115.95 each. So I want to kind of get the extended price, which is one of the things we looked at in the original report. Let's do that. We can actually add calculated columns. So I'm going to add one in here called ext price, EXT price for extended price. And that's going to be quantity. Oops, don't misspell that. If you misspell it, you get an error. Uh, quantity times unit price. And let's go and run this. And notice what we get. We get order one, line item one, quantity one, $23, $623. This one is four at $9.99, at $39.96, and so on. But what I want to do is I actually want to go ahead and group them. And so what I'm going to do is 
I'm going to add the group by to it. Now, this group is a little bit funny in the way it works. If I run this now, it actually won't group right. Because if you look at this, are these three rows exactly the same? Well, that's the same. That's not. That's not. That's not. And this is not. So if you want to group by only the orders, we've got to get rid of these three columns. So you highlight them up here in little, right, right here you've got to, oops, let me just go back on this. The way you highlight this is you kind of click on this little thing up here and then hit the delete key on the keyboard. Same thing over here and hit the delete key on the keyboard. Now let's go run this. Now we get just the extended items, but these first columns are the same. Now we can do a group by. And watch what happens. There you go. We've done that. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply an aggregate function called sum, which will now actually, whenever you use a group by, the aggregate function works on the items in the group. So if you run this, it will take all the equal orders and will add up their extended prices. So if you run this, it adds up the individual line items for that order, and you get the order total. So in fact, I'm going to change this because it's no longer extended price. This is now order total. I'm going to run it again. And there you go. So now when you create a bunch of queries, you want to save them. To save a query, you click the right mouse button on here, and you click Save, and then you give it a much better name, such as order totals. And you click OK. All right, and it shows up over here in your queries list. Now let's say we only want to find those orders that were less than $1,000. Well, then we can specify criteria here, less than 1,000. We'll run it again. And you get only those orders less than 1,000. So for the moment, uh, this is enough um, about access. Um, this is, in fact, enough to be able to complete lab uh, A1. And um, in the next tutorial, I'm going to talk about how to formulate subqueries and uh, use the divide and conquer approach to take complex queries and decompose them into multiple queries and then um, glue those subqueries together into a more complex single query.